Well, welcome today. Uh, I'm Kurt Kroenke. I'm a professor of medicine at Indiana University, and I'm pleased to be talking to you about a balanced approach uh, to treating chronic pain, uh, which would include both medications as well as uh, non-pharmacologic types of treatments. Uh, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. What I do want to remind you is you will have an opportunity to ask questions during the presentation. You just go below the video and use the chat box, answer your questions anytime during the presentation. I'm going to save some time at the, after the presentation is over to be able to address your questions. This is the outline for what I'm going to talk about. And the first topic uh, is uh, what I call the urgency of analgesia. And the principle I want to say here is uh, what I call parity of treatments. That is, most treatments are created equal. There's this quote I like by Rick uh, Deo, who's an expert in low back pain, uh, in which he wrote that although approximately 200 treatment options are available to treat low back pain, no single treatment's clearly superior. So the good news is you usually have more than one treatment, but uh, in individual patients, we may have to move from one treatment to another or combine them. Uh, many people are familiar with the zero to 10 numeric rating scale commonly used in pain. Uh, when they assess what's a small, moderate, and large effect, on this scale, about a half point uh, change over time uh, is a small effect. One point is a moderate effect. Two points is a large effect. And most pain, pain therapies, when they compare them to placebo, have a relatively small treatment effect. And I like to use uh, a metaphor which I call the stack of quarters. Um, a quarter doesn't buy much. If you have a stack of 10 quarters, you got $2.50. And in fact, if you combine the two stacks of quarters, you have $5. And that's generally the principles of pain management. That if, for example, you're using some medication, Usually, uh, if you start with two quarters and it's not working, you may go up to four quarters. You may switch treatments if it's not working to another medication or uh, non-pharmacologic treatment. So you switch to a different stack of quarters or you combine treatments like one or two medicines and a non-pharmacologic treatment, in which case uh, you have both stacks of quarters. But that's generally particularly important with pain because every single treatment has a modest effect at an individual, it may have a good effect, but we often have to combine, change, or increase doses. The principle I'd like to get across today is what I call a balanced treatment, that many patients want medications. Medications have some benefit, but there's a number of non-pharmacologic treatments which are also effective. The Institute of Medicine, now almost a decade ago, uh, had an important report and about pain, and they estimated that uh, about 100 million American adults, uh, actually more than many chronic disease, suffer from chronic pain, and there's a high cost to it, both in terms of healthcare costs as well as um, lost work productivity in particular. I'm gonna do a rapid uh, bullets here uh, from that report just to show you how pain is pervasive throughout many of the things we do in healthcare. So uh, as we said, about 30% of U.S. adults have chronic pain, uh, about one in five outpatient visits, and 10% of all drug sales are related to pain. 80% uh, of patients who undergo surgery have uh, post-operative pain, and many don't get full relief. Uh, it's an important reason for visiting the emergency department. Uh, and however, Quite a few patients who get discharged are still in moderate to severe pain. Uh, Two-thirds of nursing home residents have pain. 60% uh, of women report severe pain with their first childbirth. And the annual cost to, if you take all the developed countries in the world, is uh, up to a trillion dollars. The other uh, last quantitative piece I want to show you, and then I'll end this first piece with what I call a... Uh, qualitative comment on, on uh, the disability of chronic pain. There's a metric called years lived with disability, which takes into account how common a disease is, uh, 
how many years a person lives with that uh, disease and uh, how much it uh, impairs their function in their work and daily activities. If you take the leading medical causes, which are on the right side of the slide here, and, and they're listed, the number is how common they are in the top 30 diseases for years lived with disability. Collectively, these diseases account for 8.8 .8 million years lived with disability in the US. If you take these five chronic pain conditions, and of course the numbers uh, show you that low back pain is the number one disabling condition in the US, neck pain number four, other musculoskeletal number five, osteoarthritis number six, migraine number 14, they account for more years lived with disability, 9.7, than the common medical diseases on the right. And if you add depression and anxiety, which coexist with about half of people with chronic pain, uh, the two together cause an enormous amount of disability. Now that's the quantitative piece. Uh, I like this quote from Emily Dickinson in one of her poems where she said, pain cannot recollect when it began or if there was a time when it was not. It has no future but itself. And the other thing I point out is uh, why in practice sometimes pain can be challenging. Um, the good news is it's not fatal, but uh, it's also not very visible. It's uh, not remunerative. It's not excisable. It's not a radical. So when we deal with chronic pain, we have to understand the things that we're usually ending with chronic pain management. And it's a combination of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic approaches. So the two types of pharmacologic treatments I want to talk about is first, mainly non-opiates, because that's the direction uh, we increasingly go nowadays. But we have a large residual part of the populations who are on chronic opiates for pain. And I want to talk about that after I talk about some issues related to analgesics in general. I want to start with two cases to sort of contextualize this. So the first is a 28-year-old graduate student who's generally been in good health, seen in the emergency room for a fractured right arm and three broken ribs after an auto accident, no history of substance misuse, has three to five drinks of alcohol per week, and occasional marijuana use, recreational. What would you recommend for controlling pain uh, when you discharge uh, this person from the emergency room? Would you go with purely an NSAID in reasonable doses like ibuprofen? Or would you give the patient ibuprofen as well as maybe a three to five day prescription of opiates for breakthrough pain? Um, and I can tell you clinicians will differ on this. There's not a right answer but I pose this question just to think about what uh, each of you might do. The second uh, patient is a bit older, 54-year-old warehouse worker with chronic low back pain for 20 years. He's failed multiple medicines, physical therapy, chiropractic pain program, and uh, injections. Not a common, uncommon story for persons with chronic back pain has been in opiates for 10 years without misuse, currently on uh, morphine, uh, long-acting twice a day, and some oxycodone at not a high dose, a modest dose for uh, rescue pain. What would be your approach in this person who's been on some chronic opiates for chronic pain? Would you slowly taper opiates to discontinuation? Would you taper opiates to get to a lower dose, but maybe keep the person on opiates? Um, or would you just maintain the current dose? I can tell you, any of these three options um, can vary among clinicians. And the fact of the matter, from an evidence standpoint, we can't say right now in a person on chronic opiates uh, who has not a problem of problems with it or misuse, uh, probably uh, any of these three options could be acceptable, but clinicians will vary about their attitudes on this. So we've done a number of uh, trials, practical trials, using stepped care approach to chronic pain. And this was our uh, ladder. So at the top are things you can get over the counter, like acetaminophen or NSAIDs. In the second category, you have uh, tricyclic antidepressants, uh, 
Uh, muscle relaxants like cyclobenzaprine uh, have quite an analogy biochemically to tricyclics. That was kind of in the second category. Then the gabapentinoids, either gabapentin or pregabalin. Then uh, SNRI antidepressants, one that people may be familiar with is duloxetin, but there's another, milnasopram. And then we went into the opiates, um, if everything else had failed. And that could be, at the time, tramadol was considered a lesser opiate. Over time, it's now lumped together. Um, so then there's the opiate category. And then we had topicals. What's changed in our most recent trial is uh, the opiates have come off the list. So for chronic pain, if a person's not on chronic opiates, no longer would that be part of our, our ladder. And that's been a change just in the last five years because of recommendations that have come out. Now, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, just this year released an evidence report looking at the literature of non-opiate analgesics. So that ladder I just saw you, everything there except, except opiates. They found 157 good and fair quality trials. Most of the trials uh, were less than six months. So it was three to six months because chronic pain means you have it at least three months. And these were the treatment of chronic pain. Um, only 18 trials went longer than six months and only nine trials longer than a year. So even in this chronic pain evidence, we have what would be considered short-term, three to six months. The conditions studied, the big players are osteoarthritis, neuropathic pain, fibromyalgia, and inflammatory arthritis, things like rheumatoid arthritis, spondylar arthropathies, and seven on low back pain. There's many more acute trials of medicines for low back pain, which I'll show you, but in the chronic pain literature, these were the most common conditions. Uh, now, Chow, who led the other review, did a paper several years ago, a review of the literature just on back pain. And here's the number of trials. So the three most common studied categories were NSAIDs, opiates, and muscle relaxants. And this included uh, acute and chronic back pain. So many of these trials were more recent onset back pain. Interestingly, the only drugs they found effective were NSAIDs, opiates, and a few trials on duloxetin. What's also important to look is the drugs compared to placebo that were not more effective than placebo. So muscle relaxants, the antidepressants, the gabapentinoids, and acetaminophen. We'll come back to acetaminophen um, because what we've learned about that in the last five years has been interesting. So the question is, how much better than placebo? So I'm going to show you some of those classes, and we're going to show you the point change in the trials on a 0 to 100 scale. And if you remember from the first slide, one point on a 10-point scale or 10 points on a 100-point scale is a moderate effect. So here's the number of trials for NSAIDs, for example, 13 for back pain and 9 for osteoarthritis, and you can see the number of trials for opiates, acetaminophen, and a few for gabapentin. What you'll see is, again, the two effective classes for back pain, and this included recent onset back pain, largely came down to NSAIDs and opiates. Surprisingly, acetaminophen was not more effective than placebo, and neither was gabapentin. And that in osteoarthritis, uh, NSAIDs, opiates, and then a smaller effect for acetaminophen. So here it highlights uh, the two most effective classes, both in terms of number of trials done, but also um, on the number of points on a zero to 100 scale. Now, this is knee osteoarthritis, and it shows three classes, NSAIDs. They split out tramadol, because a lot of these trials were done when tramadol uh, was felt to be, shall I say, a lesser opiate. Not the case anymore, and then opiates. And the key point is, and, and they're looking at a 0 to 100 pain score, and the average effect for all three classes of drugs were around 18 points, so almost close to two points in these trials. So again, this emphasizes that NSAIDs and opiates, uh, 
are about equally effective. Now, remember I said equally effective um, because we used to think of opiates as a stronger pain medicine. And as the literature comes out uh, from many, many studies, it's not necessarily the highly potent analgesics we once thought it was. It and NSAIDs uh, generally, on average, are about equally effective in terms of pain relief. Now, I have one slide on some medications that I showed from my analgesic ladder that are not NSAIDs and opiates or acetaminophen. And I kind of put them in three buckets. There's the tricyclics at the top, two of those. There's these gabapentinoids, which are gabapentin and a related medicine, pregabalin. And then there's the uh, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake and inhibitors. This is a class related to the antidepressants. Then the faxine was the first. So instead of SSRIs, with the most commonly used antidepressants, these are SNRIs. And for fibromyalgia, the two effective classes are the gabapentinoids and the SNRIs. And for neuropathic pain, it's again the gabapentinoids and the SNRIs. So in general, for either fibromyalgia or neuropathic pain, the two most effective classes are gabapentinoids and the SNRIs. There's uh, the evidence-based report also mentioned there was some evidence for mantine, which is a Alzheimer's drug for fibromyalgia, and some for uh, uh, an anticonvulsant oxcarbamazepine. But frankly, these are not two medicines that the average clinician, including me, uses very often. So our menu for treating fibromyalgia and neuropathic, if we're treating it pharmacologically, uh, would largely come from the gabapentinoid class or the SNRI class. Finally, a couple, uh, two classes of medicines that were often considered uh, complementary or CAM medicines. One would be intraarticular hyaluronic acid and the other would be glucosamine with or without chondroitin. Lots of trials. Intraarticular hyaluronic acid uh, tends to be beneficial uh, for particularly things like knee arthritis, it may have a role, whereas not strong evidence for glucosamine or chondroitin. So I'm talking a little bit more now about uh, the opiates, um, and much of the conference will be talking about safety issues related to opiates and reduction in opiate use, and that's entirely appropriate. So I'm just going to show you uh, a several points about what I call where do they have a role left yet, if they do have one. And in fact, there's been quite a pendulum swing in the last 20 years. Uh, in the early 1990s, chronic pain was a, considered a disease that warrants aggressive and humane treatment, and there was a upswing in the prescribing of opiates. And then about four to five years ago, it was recognized we had a real problem in this country with opiate epidemic. And if you're on the left, you'd say you would liberally use opiates back in the 1990s. If you're way on the right, you'd say there's very limited role. And uh, even among experts, there are people that say we should discontinue a large majority of people on chronic opiates if possible. There's others that say, well, if they're having problems, discontinue. Don't start them as much as we used to, but uh, leave well enough alone if they're doing fine. Um, what are the complications if people initially get opiates? Well, two of them are you either uh, become, take, go on them chronically or you actually, worse, get an opiate use disorder, which is, in a, in a short way of saying, an addiction. These are a number of studies that have been done. You can see different populations, some with very large numbers. And in general, about one in 20 people who get an initial opiate script may end up on chronic opiates. And about one in 200 who get an initial script may end up with actually an opiate use disorder. What about the big one, which is fatal opiate overdose risk? That's the one that appropriately has gathered a lot of attention. And so, 
Here we're going to compare to if you're on a very low dose of opiate, like less than 20 morphine equivalents per day, which might be, in the, in the old days, a couple hydrocodone a day. And that if you're on more than 50, uh, what we call MMEs, uh, the number needed to treat with that dose to get one fatal overdose is 667. And if you're on more than 100 a day, it's one in 400. It shows you that most people on these doses chronically don't overdose, and some of the overdoses occur in those not prescribed opiates, but who are getting them illicitly or on the street. But still, since this occurs uh, especially among young people in middle age, it's an important problem. And we, of course, have seen that as we've had prescribing restrictions, the top line, that opiate-related mortality due to prescription opiates is plateaued. It's not gone away but it's plateaued, and there's been an escalation in uh, illicit opiate overdoses, things like illicit fentanyl and heroin. I'm a chronic pain researcher and clinician and not an addiction specialist, and so I think it's your perspective. So I see patients with chronic pain, and I'm trying to think how can I manage their pain um, without using opiates, but not necessarily... Uh, an absence of opiates or withdrawing everybody. Others who are seeing the big addiction problem um, are obviously, you know, trying to uh, get as many people off. Again, I would emphasize my view is we should have many fewer starts for chronic pain, maybe as a last resort, but very few people. We do have about 8 to 10 million people who are on opiates in the U.S. for chronic pain. What's your approach is to those uh, and where you fall out, I sort of illustrated the options in the, in the second case. So what did the guidelines say that came out in 2016? It, some looked at it as biblical. And actually, the CDC has come back and said these were guidelines. These were not absolutes. And when you look at the guidelines, they're actually quite reasonable. Um, we had uh, initially, because of what I would say would be a quite... Uh, restrictive reaction to the guidelines uh, by many payers and states. We had written a little piece uh, several years back, and then others had written about the issue of, well, how many people do we get off at chronic pain uh, who have been on opiates? How fast is, uh, or do we settle at a safer dose? And that's a, that's a debate that goes on. And then others have written, a group came out and talking about with a severe reduction, in other words, patients, sometimes uh, their doctor would just say, we're not going to give you any opiates. Patients with who on opiates would not be taken up by practices um, because nobody wanted to prescribe opiates. And so there had been some uh, groups that had written about this. Including the last one was by um, the lead author of the CDC guidelines, who last year wrote and said, well, with absolute discontinu discontinuation and tapering in everybody, you know, um, there's probably a, a middle road approach. The guidelines are, uh, make sense. In other words, um, non-pharmacologic and non-opiates are preferable? Definitely. Um, establish treatment goals if the patient's on chronic opiates, uh, if their pain's not being controlled, uh, obviously continuing doesn't make sense. Uh, start with immediate release opiates, and now there's been a pushback about using long-acting opiates. There's some increased risk. Use safe thresholds. In other words, if patients are on chronic opiates but can't completely come off, get to lower doses. If you're going to prescribe for acute pain, that was the first case, probably no more than three to five days. And you know, follow the prescription data monitoring program in your state. A person on chronic opiates should have naloxone, um, periodic drug tests. Definitely avoid benzos. More recently, they found gabapentin may be risky with opiates, so that'd be two classes of drugs you wouldn't want to co-prescribe in patients on opiates. And for those who actually have a disorder, medication-assisted treatment. And in some cases, if patients can't come off and they're having problems, um, there's a move to switch to a safer medication, buprenorphine. These are the things that CDC did not say it was forbidden to use opiates or palliative and end-of-life care. Uh, 
last resort in chronic pain, but again, I say this would be a very small group of patients, and maybe a role in acute pain. Um, probably NSAID should be the first line of treatment, but um, maybe uh, for severe pain or for breakthrough pain, a very small number of opiates. Part of the problem in the past is people would get 60 to 90 pills of opiates rather than three to five days. And then in the other three settings is what about surgery, dentistry, and emergency room? The top half of the slide talks about the problem of people had gotten uh, a lot of opiates after surgery, much of it went unused, uh, many didn't continue it. So if we give opiates at all anymore from any of these settings, and, and sometimes people aren't, they're using NSAIDs in surgery, they're using uh, various kinds of blocks and things, but uh, probably very short-term prescriptions. And with dental and ER pain, on average, NSAIDs tend to be about as effective as opiates. Uh, I tend to be... Uh, a person who falls in between, I think, uh, as you can see when I've talked about opiates here, I believe in what I call um, a middle way. And we had a consensus report come out uh, several years ago arguing that um, if we're not going to use opiates as much, we probably need better reimbursement and access for chronic pain programs, um, probably not do collateral damage at the end of life care or for people with severe pain for a short term. Um, reimburse for some of the things like urine drug testing, the time it takes to check prescription drug monitoring programs, and uh, medication-assisted treatment for people with OUD and track outcomes of opiate reduction policies. Uh, a word on cannabis. Uh, there have been 27 chronic pain trials. There's a low strength of evidence. And most of it's been in neuropathic pain. There have been some harms that have been articulated in population studies. Most trials were short and used synthetic FDA-approved cannabinoids rather than what most people are going to get through marijuana or other products. And results were similar in another systematic review. So the point is about cannabis, if people are using it for chronic pain, I as a clinician would not say don't use it. Would I recommend it? I'm Probably not at this point, uh, simply because the evidence is not as strong for some, as for some of the other pain treatments we have. Um, another, also being strongly promoted is CBT oil. This is the CBT oil miracle book. Uh, the evidence is there's a lot of products. It's projected to be a $60 billion business. Again, there's uh, an insufficient trial evidence for its role in pain. Um, and... Uh, it could cause a, drug, a positive drug test, although if it comes from certain products, it's uh, much less likely. So pharmacotherapy highlights for chronic musculoskeletal pain, which is about 75% of chronic pain. NSAIDs and opiates have the most evidence. Acetaminophen is rather disappointing for chronic pain. For fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain, the two classes tend to be gabapentinoids and SNRI antidepressants. Not effective in chronic pain, cyclobenzaprine, a common muscle relaxant, capsaicin, and uh, oral steroids. I have a couple slides on non-pharmacologic therapy, um, but one in particular summarizes it all, and that's this. They did an evidence-based review, again from ARC, uh, published uh, just a few years back. The most evidence and these are all ones that have some evidence, is exercise, 122 trials, uh, actually evidence for chiropractic, acupuncture, multidisciplinary pain programs, and psychologic therapies, particularly CBT, and also some evidence for massage, yoga, and mind mindfulness, and tai chi. So we have a menu. So I think with chronic pain, um, providing these as options for patients, uh, and some, what needs to be emphasized, some of these require work, and they're indicated by A. So a person has to exercise. A person has to do the homework for cognitive behavioral therapy and yoga and mindfulness. Others may not require the, as much work, but may require a series of treatments. So just recall this menu. I think patients you know, should increasingly be encouraged to do at least 
one or more of these along with medications they might take. Caveats for non-pharmacologic pain. Um, evidence standards are, even though there's many good trials, they're not as strict as pharmacologic treatments which require uh, FDA approval. The placebo is less perfect. You can't find an identical red pill. You can use attention placebo controls, sham acupuncture, um, but probably the placebo masking is slightly less. Usually, uh, some of these require multiple sessions and more importantly, patient motivation and work. Uh, they've not been proven superior, superior to analgesics. Um, so they, I, I put them side by side, including patient preferences. Um, we would need a number of trained and interested providers to provide these services and probably uh, reimbursement issues have to be addressed. Placebo is interesting because pain responses to placebo range from 30 to 50 percent. Um, there is a biological inter, uh, underpinning when you image brains of people who get placebo. Some of the same areas in the brain light up as active treatments. Um, and even some interesting research when patients are told they're being given a placebo, they get some response to it. So we used to believe it was only if they didn't know they were getting a placebo. That's actually quite surprising. And however, current practice does not condone us giving sugar pills. So, but what this is encouraging about is we can take advantage of both the specific and nonspecific effects of evidence-based treatments, and it probably doubles the benefit. So let me close in the last several uh, minutes on what I call measurements and models. This is a pain scale. Many use the numeric pain rating scale. This has a couple pain interference items. It's quite simple. It was actually sent out by the Surgeon General in the opiate reduction uh, advice that came out to two and a half million prescribers. And so this is a pain scale. Since depression and anxiety are quite common, this is a brief scale, PHQ-4, which has a two item anxiety scale and a two item depression scale. Uh, when I'm treating a patient with pain, what makes me change treatment? I look at three things. I look at the score. So if they came in with a score of seven, I'd like to get it lower. And as I told you, one point is a moderate uh, benefit, two points is a large benefit. So you're not gonna get them down to two. But if you go from seven to five, that's an improvement. I also ask them globally, um, do you feel like you've improved? Because the score is one thing, but their global assessment, like they're better or not, and do they want to change in treatment? Surprisingly, in our chronic pain trials, sometimes patients don't want change in their treatment. So I think these are my three criteria. The other thing to recognize is chronic pain is seldom a single site. That um, uh, This was a study done of 544 patients in uh, two pain trials, and only 6% had one site. So if you have a patient with low back pain and think that's the only place they hurt, if you were to ask about other places in their body, you'd usually find several other sites as well. We've done a bunch of telecare trials. This is just some synopsis of some lessons learned from the trials we've done. Um, there's been over a couple thousand patients in it. Three of the eight trials also treated depression along with the pain. All trials aimed to optimize analgesics, but five trials also used a behavioral intervention. Five trials showed superiority versus usual care, and the treatment effect was in the moderate range. I think it's interesting because obviously we're more in a virtual care mode now, but this was before COVID, and I think telecare uh, in the future can play a big role in the follow-up and monitoring and adjustment of pain treatments. Let me pause over this. These are some points that I think can increase the scalability of, of telecare, centralize it so one person can cover multiple practices. You can increase the number of conditions, so don't only treat pain, but maybe treat depression or anxiety. You can automate some of the things, like automated monitoring and uh, automated self-management. We probably need to target it to the right people and stratify it, and we need to empower the patient in managing the symptoms and in communicating with providers. It's the pain referral is interesting because as I, as I show these different specialties who have an interest in pain, it's only a minority of all of these specialties that is strongly interested in chronic pain. So you have to, uh, within any of these specialties, it's not just a referral to say one of these specialties, it's a referral to one of these specialties if they have an interest in chronic pain. And then there's obviously other 
uh, providers involved, like physical therapy, complementary and alternative medicine providers, and palliative care. So I want to close on a quote by, uh, from the perspective we wrote several years ago. So imperfect treatments do not justify therapeutic nihilism. A broad menu of partially effective treatment options maximizes the chances of achieving at least partial amelioration of chronic pain. And with that, I am ending my formal remarks, and I'll be pleased to move on and take the questions you may have sent in.